This is part of our video series on human-centered evaluations for NLP explanations. Check out the link for more resources. You're currently here. Hi, sure. Why are there two of us here? Well, Jordan, uh, in this video, we're going to have a computer try to explain why it made a decision to a human. And it's useful to have two people to play both sides of that interaction. Fun! Okay, so let's say that you, sure, are a computer that can look at a patient's medical record, their x-rays, their lab results, what have you. And you could tell me whether the patient has cancer or not. So what about uh, patient uh, Mustaman here? Does he have cancer? Positive. Good to know, I guess, but uh, why? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, my binary is a little rusty, so that's not very helpful. Could we do better? Yes, with the magic of local post hoc explanations. Okay, so you're going to have to explain your explanations. What are local explanations? Local simply means that we're going to generate explanations for each individual example. Okay, post hoc means after this in Latin, but what does it mean for explaining what a machine did? Post hoc means that we generate the explanation using a different process from the prediction. Let's dig into this with a little bit more rigor. Sure, let's say that I have a function g. It takes input x and outputs y. How do you get an explanation out of it? It's a black box, right? No. We usually assume that the explanation function or the explainer has full access to the model. In the case of a neural model, it can see all of the gradient and activation functions of everything going on. Does it have to use that to create an explanation? No. For a post hoc explanation, the explainer E can really be any arbitrary function. So that means it does not need to follow the G's computation. Which makes sense, since G is designed to generate a label, but what we want from E is something more interpretable. So what sort of creative things can you do with an explainer? Really anything you want. You could indeed use the internal computation of the model to create an explanation. By putting a second head on the model that would output the explanation? For instance, but you can really do anything you like. You could run multiple versions of the model to create an explanation. So this is what you do if the model were non-deterministic? Could be, but more often, you slightly perturb the inputs to see how that changes the model. Or you could use a totally different model altogether to generate your explanation. But if your explanation model pi has nothing to do with the original model, how can you claim that you're actually explaining what the real model G is doing? That's a good point. That's why we need evaluations in later videos. So let's go into a little bit more detail about how you can do post hoc explanation on a running example of explaining legal entailment. What's legal entailment? So here we have a context paragraph and a statement. The problem is whether the context entails the statement. In other words, whether the statement is a logical conclusion from the context. Here, the context is a snippet from a case file of Federal Court of Canada case law. This case concerns a decision to refuse a visa. The decision is essentially an administrative one made in the exercise of discretion by the visa officer. There's no requirement to personally interview the applicant. This is not a circumstance of a judicial decision by the visa officer which would attract the principle that he who hears must decide, or the reverse that he who decides must hear the applicant. That doesn't sound fun. Luckily, we have a computer yeah. to explain what's going on in this case. So the thing here that we need to predict is whether the statement, the rule of he who decides must hear, does not apply to administrative decisions. Could this claim be supported by something in the context? So I guess the first question is, is this an administrative question or not? Yes, so both the statement and the context is talking about an administrative decision, not a judicial one. Okay, well then, if it is administrative, does the rule of he who decides must hear apply? At the end of the context, we can see a mention of this exact same rule. 
And the context says this applies to a judicial decision. And the magic word here is not a negation. Yes. So for this example, the answer is yes. The context does entail the state. But let's say that we have trained a binary classification model to either say yes or no given a context and a statement. But that's not an explanation. How should I know if I should trust this answer? Let's start with something relatively simple. We're not going to try to explain why the system gives an answer. We're just going to try to explain how certain we are of that answer. This is called a uncertainty estimate. A typical uncertainty estimate is just a number. For example, the model might say it's 92% confident. That sounds useful. Where does this number come from? Well, for models trained with maximum likelihood, which is most supervised learning models, the final output is a distribution over all possible labels. This is the probability of y given x the probability of the label given the input. And this is a number between 0 and 1. Higher means that it's more confident in the answer. But how reliable is this number? Well, it's supposed to be reliable. It's supposed to approximate the probability of the answer. Is there a reason that you said supposed to? Well, let's take a look at this example. The model says that it's 92% confident and that the answer is correct. That must mean that if we look at examples with over 90% confidence, they're only wrong 10% of the time? That's the thing. If you collect all examples where the model is more than 90% confident and compute the model's accuracy on these examples, the accuracy is usually not 90%, but lower. This gap between the expected accuracy and the actual accuracy is called the calibration error. But neural networks are never wrong, surely. Indeed, for neural networks, the actual accuracy is usually lower than the expected accuracy, which means the model is usually overconfident. This makes models' output probability a bad uncertainty estimate. So could we make these numbers closer to reality? Yes, we can take a survey of all the times the model says its confidence is more than 80%. Use that bin to create new accuracy, a HALA dataset of course, and then use that new accuracy as the new calibrated confidence. And presumably you do that over all the possible confidence bins. Indeed. This is a cheap method to get better uncertainty estimate from the model. And the only cost is some additional held out data, which you can simply use the validation set and a little bit of statistics. Uncertainty estimation seems pretty straightforward, but just showing a number seems a little bit dry. And I'm not sure if people can reliably interpret those numbers. The number's better than nothing, but does this really help make an informed decision? Why is the confidence so high or low? So the next form of explanation we'll talk about will be much more accessible, and it comes with fancier visualizations. Remember when we introduced this example, we underlined some important segments from the context? Yeah, that made it much easier to see what the answer would be. Wouldn't it be nice that the model could generate something like that? And that's exactly what we'll talk about in the next video. This video isn't the end. You're currently here. If you're lost, click on the link below for source code, slides, and other resources.